Hello, welcome to the first lecture on the second chapter of our of our year, which is Life in the Colonies. Um, when we talk about Life in the Colonies, we're focusing on the 13 English colonies that are founded along the eastern coast of North America. Keep in mind, though, there are other colonies, right, the Spanish colonies out west, and the French colonies kind of in the Midwest. Um, and those places are shaped and influenced by, by those nations originally, but we're focusing here on the 13 English colonies. And so the question I want you to keep in mind throughout this whole chapter uh, is what were the major factors contributing to colonization and how did those factors influence life in the colonies? So you may know, right, the first English colony to be established successfully is in Virginia and it's Jamestown. That's in 1607. And so it was actually founded by a joint stock company. And so a joint stock company is something you might be familiar with. Uh, it's essentially a group of people, investors, pooling all their capital, all their money, um, to finance something, right? And in this case, it was to finance a uh, colony in Virginia where they were going to grow tobacco. And right, and every year, the investors, those who put money up front, would get a percentage back each year, and it would eventually become a profit for them, right? So there was an economic motivation here, economic motivation for the founding of Jamestown. And like I said, it was for really mainly originally for the growth of tobacco. And also, ideally, they would hope to find uh, gold and things like that there, although they did not. Uh, Jamestown su succeeded as a colony, but did not look very bright at the time, right? And imagine being one of those original colonists. Uh, you did not know it was going to be successful. Uh, and for many, it actually was not successful because for many, they died. Um, and so the original group, many of the original group of colonists, 1607, did die. They did not, they did not survive. Uh, in 1609, a couple hundred new colonists arrived, uh, and by the end of the year, by the end of that winter, uh, with a lack of food, with the Native American groups there destroying their crops uh, and, and attacking them, only 60 of that 600 survived, right? So it was successful that it kept going, but it was really not successful for most of the people who went there. Um, the Native American group that was around them, the Powhatan, uh, they had a very tense relationship with the English, right? Unlike... Um, the Spanish and the French uh, explorers and, and colonizers, there's very little English interest in intermarrying or, or working at all, really cooperating with the Native Americans. Uh, out of the, all of them, they were kind of the, they treated the Native Americans the worst. Uh, and so that showed, right, and the Powhatan did not like that, and they did things like destroying their crops, um, barricading them in, forcing them to essentially starve to death. There's even rumors that people in Jamestown during these first early years resorted to cannibalism uh, and desperation. Uh, so it was not a pretty scene, right? And most people who went there did not survive. Uh, but nonetheless, it was ultimately the beginning of an English presence in North America. The next group of colonies to form um, are in Massachusetts, right? And originally there's actually two groups, um, the Pilgrims and the Puritans, that established these, um, these colonies. So Puritans were members of the Church of England. So after the Catholic, after the Protestant Reformation in the 1500s, uh, England, the Church of England separated from the Roman Catholic Church um, and became Protestant, right? But the Puritans were those who believed that the Church of English, uh, Church of England, I should say, uh, was too Catholic. It didn't look, it wasn't changed enough, right? And they wanted to try to change it from within. Pilgrims were Puritans, but believed there was no hope in saving the Church of England, that it was too Catholic, and they had to make their own church. So the pilgrims separated from um, the Church of England, whereas the Puritans remained in the Church of England. Right? So the pilgrims are the first. They're persecuted for, for what they did, right? for trying to uh, separate from the church. And they eventually flee to first Holland, uh, which is the Netherlands, and then they flee. They form a colony in Massachusetts. Right? And it's called the Plymouth Colony. So Plymouth Rock, you might have heard. Uh, and it becomes the foundation for modern-day New England. An important part of the Pilgrim experience, right, on the boat over, was the Mayflower Compact. And so while Pilgrims were the main group, there were others on the boat as well who feared a kind of theocracy or a, religion, a religiously dominated government. And so an agreement was made on the boat for it landing that they would sign, uh, they signed that formed a civil government that was democratic ish, right? It allowed for a representative government and people who were not pilgrims to kind of be a part of that. So it's an important first kind of one of the first um, precedents set for what would become the Constitution of the United States, this idea of a democratic society, right? So it's important for that sense um, to keep that in mind. 
Another colony of what becomes Massachusetts is the Massachusetts Bay Colony, a couple of years, about 10 years later in 1630. And that's now not pilgrims, that are the Puritans, right? The ones who did not leave the Church of England. And they arrived to establish a city upon a hill, right? They, like the pilgrims, believed if they could found a colony that was uh, about them, right, they could create the city upon a hill, which is kind of like, uh, it was like Jerusalem, right? The heavenly Jerusalem. Like it was the ideal city that would be perfectly formed in religion. Um, and it was led by a man named John Winthrop, right? And he was the guy who gave this a sermon called The City Upon a Hill, which is a really famous sermon. Um, and it really was a religiously motivated colony, right? They came to establish this ideal society. Uh, but Puritans were not known to be very tolerant, right? They wanted Puritans and only Puritans. They did not want really many other Protestant groups, and especially not Roman Catholics or Jewish people, right? And so it was not a very tolerant um, society. That can be kind of demonstrated by the Salem witch trials that happened in the 1690s, right? So kind of as a result of that intolerance. These two colonies eventually become one to form the Massachusetts colony, right? The, the, what would become the state of Massachusetts. In New England, particularly, there's a lot of tension with the Native Americans. Um, so again, like the English, unlike the Spanish and the French, do not really cooperate or, or mix well with the Native Americans, or uh, as well. Um, and so as more and more colonists are arriving in the Massachusetts colonies, they start spreading out, right? They start looking for more land, uh, more farmland, things like that. So they start spreading out into what becomes Connecticut uh, and New Hampshire, founded New Hampshire in 1629, Connecticut in 1636, right? They're kind of the spillover from the Massachusetts colonies. So they're largely Puritan. A couple other um, groups of Protestants are mixed in there, but they're largely Puritans as well. Uh, and this tension with Native Americans flies up in two famous kind of conflicts that happened. There's the Pequot War in 1637, which is fought in Connecticut, um, when the Native Americans tried to resist the encroachment of these um, Europeans. And there's also King Philip's War, right? When the Wamapanag chief, a man named Metacombe, who the English called King Philip, hence the name King Philip's War, um, decided to, again, try to stop the spread of the English colonists into Native American land. Both cases, the Native Americans lost, but they did manage to kind of surprise and, and, and impact the English colonies somewhat, right? They, um, in King Philip's War, it's estimated 10% of the male colonists died in the fight. Um, plenty of settlements and towns and villages were destroyed, right? So they did damage, for sure, but ultimately, just they were outnumbered and outgunned, right? And so they eventually lost these wars. Another common reason and motivation for um, the founding of the new colonies uh, is dissent, right? And particularly with regards to religion. So the Puritans, like we said, wanted to build a city upon a hill, right? A, a religiously governed and inspired government and city. Um, but in Protestantism, right, when one person disagrees, right, they believe they can kind of just separate from the main fold, uh, and that leads to some problems, right? And, and people... Um, who disagree are kind of persecuted and exiled from the Massachusetts colony. And so one example of this is a man named Roger Williams, uh, who preached freedom of religion and tolerance of Native Americans, right? So that not just, if you're a Puritan, that's fine, but you can also should be allowed to be other things, and we should not, I mean, have no right to take away the land of the Native Americans. Pretty radical uh, ideas for a Puritan society, right? Because most people during this time, you have to remember, had no interest in, in tolerating Native Americans, and the Puritans were Puritan and one only Puritans. So he was exiled, banished from the colony, and he fled then, and he established his own colony uh, as a town named Providence, which eventually becomes the capital of a new uh, colony of Rhode Island in 1636. So at this point we have all, by, by 1636-37, you have all the New England colonies have been established. You have New Hampshire, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Rhode Island. In New Hampshire. Uh, another kind of famous example of religious dissent and leaving is a woman named Anne Hutchinson. She does not found her own colony, but she uh, starts preaching, right, to people that you don't need a church or leaders to interpret the Bible. It's only personal interpretations. She's also banished. She makes her way down to modern day New York, uh, around the, in the Bronx, and she's actually eventually killed during a, a war with Native Americans. She's kind of caught in the crossfire. But if you guys have ever driven up in the Bronx, you've ever heard of Hutchinson Parkway, uh, it's named after Anne Hutchinson. 
on the one hand, there was religious dissent established as colonies, and I guess related to that, but slightly different, is that the the desire for religious toleration, right? And so there's two colonies in particular that are established because of minority religious groups who want religious toleration. So you have William Penn, uh, and establishes the colony of Pennsylvania in 1681, right? He's a given he's given a charter to found the colony, right? So we're going to talk about the difference between uh, royal and chartered colonies in a little bit. Uh, he was a Quaker, right? At the time, they were considered radical as well. They had no ministers. Uh, they believed that anyone could be inspired by the Holy Spirit to speak. And so at a, a Quaker meeting, there wasn't really a service necessarily, but people would get up and they would speak from the heart. Um, this radicalness, this lack of leadership is what made it radical. Uh, it was founded as a haven for Quakers, but quickly many other groups come uh, because of the good land, access to land, and, and growing crops, um, and a good harbor in Philadelphia. And so many of the groups arrive, but they still emphasize religious toleration, and they allow other Christians to practice their beliefs. The Calvert family, also known as, uh, the leader of them known as Lord Baltimore, uh, who were, they were Catholic, they get permission to create a Catholic haven, a Catholic colony of Maryland, named after uh, a queen, a Catholic queen in, um, in Europe. And that was in 1632. Right, and so early on in their tradition, 1649, they create what's called the Maryland Toleration Act, and this allows anyone who's Christian, whether they're Catholic, uh, Puritan, Quaker, right, as long as they're Christian, they are free to practice their faith. So it's very tolerant for, for the time period, but keep in mind, right, that does not allow Jewish people to practice their faith, uh, Muslims either, but there's not really many Muslims in in in, in America at that time. Right, so that's another reason, not just dissent, but also religious toleration. That's an important one, because that actually is found in a lot of different ones, right? Also, places like Rhode Island and Connecticut kind of emphasize this toleration as well, since they were established by radical, um, banished Puritans from New England. As we get into the Mid-Atlantic, right, there's a kind of a unique um, colony experience in the middle of all the English colonies, and that's New Amsterdam or New Netherland, right, which is modern-day New York City and state. Because uh, that's controlled by the Dutch, not the English, and it's arguably the the most important, uh, the best, one of the best harbors in the world is New York City, right? And so it becomes a very important post for economic benefits. It's founded by the Dutch uh, West Indian Company. So again, this is motivated not by religious toleration or or beliefs, but by economics, by desire for wealth and money. And so they establish it for the fur trade, and immediately becomes very ethnic, ethnic, ethnically diverse. Sorry. Um, you have people from all over the world. Once slaves start getting imported, you have Africans coming, right? It's a very diverse place, uh, even from the beginning. It still is today, right? Uh, they had a better but still tense relationship with Native Americans because um, they had to rely on Native Americans for the fur trade. There are a couple examples of wars, like Keefe's War, um, but overall, they have a slightly better relationship than the English do. But by 1664, the English kind of invade, and without firing a shot, they conquer... New York City, right? Peter Stuyvesant, and the governor at the time surrenders the city because he had not enough people to defend it, right? And so once it becomes an English colony in 1664, it becomes known as New York, uh, New York being a, named after the, one of the dukes in, in England. And so we're going to stop here for a second. We're talking about colonies just to kind of explain what the difference between a royal and a chartered colony is. So a chartered colony is a colony that was when the founders, a group of people, private citizens or a private company, like a joint stock company, like the Dutch West Indian Company or the English West Indian Company, right, uh, are given charters, right, granting them land to establish colony in the new world. Uh, and they are independently governed. So if you have a charter, the person with the charter or the family or the group with the charter are the ones who get to decide how the, go how the colony is going to be run um, and who makes the rules. So a lot of these become democratic, right? You have an elected executive, like a governor, and you have an elected assembly, people who make laws. On the other hand, though, you have a royal colony, and these are ruled directly by the monarch, right? So it's the monarch's land, right? And so an example of this would be the Carolinas after a while. Um, and so that means the profits and, and stuff from the, from the colony go to the crown, go to the monarch. Uh, the governors of the, of the place are appointed by the crown, they are democratic, democratically elected assemblies in each of these places, but they could be disbanded or prevented from meeting, um, and they ultimately have to kind of defer to the crown, the monarch. 
So like I said, Carolina is one of these examples. It was founded as one colony originally, a private charter colony in 1663. Uh, but by 1729, the, the original owners sell it to the crown, who then divide it into North and South Carolina. Georgia is founded, the last of the colonies to be founded is 1732. Um, and it was supposed to be originally designed as a private colony for the haven for debtors, right? Debtors are people who were being thrown in jail for owing money, right? And so the thought was, let's give them land and a place to go and kind of create a new life. They originally prohibited slavery, which is interesting as a deep southern state and one of the major parts of the Confederacy when we get to the Civil War, but they originally prohibited it. Once it becomes a royal colony in 1752, the governor is appointed by the crown and the monarch reverses it and allows for slavery to happen in Georgia. So those are kind of just briefly highlighting the years and, and some of the, and how these 13 original colonies formed. Um, as we go through the unit, we'll look at kind of what life was like in some of these different places um, and what happens to these colonies as we move on.